Good morning. Before we get started here, uh, I just wanted to recognize, we have any visitors in, in, uh, in here with us today? If you're a visitor with us, uh, visiting for the first time, uh, don't be shy. Raise your hand, and we don't want to do, uh, we've, got some, we've got a visitor here, we've got a visitor here, we've got a visitor right here, and uh, some uh, welcome back visitors in the back as well. So let's, let's go ahead and... Uh, If you would take just a moment, put your name on our uh, visitor list in the back, we'd appreciate that very much. Well, you know, today's uh, scripture text lends itself very well to our crusade of hope. I mean, in reality, all scripture speaks personally to the hope crusade. Because the Bible's overall theme is God's never-ending pursuit. Listen, God's theme throughout the Bible is his never-ending pursuit of a personal relationship with his creation. And his message of hope for that relationship is interwoven throughout all of Scripture. The reality is that God's hope message of life eternal is being extended to the world every single day. The entire world has an opportunity to learn firsthand what God's unconditional love looks like. Now, any thought as to where the glimpse of God's loving nature is going to come from? Well, if you're not quite sure, the title of today's message will be a clue. On display. Now, if that hasn't tipped you off, the sermon text will. It's from 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. And it says this, but thanks be to God, who always puts us on display in Christ, and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For to God, we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. To some, we are an aroma of death leading to death, but to others, an aroma of life leading to life. Now there's some points of emphasis in this scripture that I'd like to talk about today. Because Paul is referencing and he's speaking directly to the body of Christ. The redeemed. Those who are justified by the blood of Jesus. Now when this was written, Paul was referring specifically to the believers in Corinth. However, since God's word is living and active, and since it is an eternal word of God... We read it as though it's talking personally to us. And as we begin to examine it and breaking it down, what's the first thing that Paul does in this scripture? Thanks be to God. He gives thanks to God. Here's a daily tip. Give thanks to God. Every single day. Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the operative phrase here is, in everything. That means there is no stipulation for giving thanks to God. Is there anything in Scripture that gives you the idea that our thanksgiving to God is conditional? You know, as long as you're having a great day, Give thanks to God. You know, it's all turning up roses to me, so I think I'll, I'll give God some thanksgiving. As a coach, I always enjoyed listening to the athletes being interviewed after the big win. Tell the viewing audience what you're feeling right now at this moment after this huge win. Well, first, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave me the ability. He gave me the courage to do what I did today. You know, I got to admit, when I do hear them say that, I get excited. But the problem with hearing that only after the big win, especially as someone who doesn't know the Lord and they hear that, they're apt to think God is worthy of our thanksgiving only after the big victory. The truth is, God is just as worthy after the tough loss. But have you heard anyone lately, um, we're here with the losing quarterback. 
after the big loss today, anything you'd like to say? Yes, well first I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the ability and the courage to play this great game and, and for the wisdom to keep it all in perspective. Now I know there's people out there that believe that, athletes that think that way and understand it that way, but losing players aren't getting interviewed a whole lot, you know, after the game. We have to keep everything in perspective. Thanking God only after the big win or after the biopsy was negative isn't fully obeying the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The truth is, we should be going around thanking the Lord in everything. And 1 Thessalonians tells us that it is the will of God that we thank him in all situations. One of the reasons God wants us doing that, when we're thanking him, when we're sincerely thanking him, we cannot be at the same time focusing on ourselves. Our own problems, our own situation, our own poor me, and poor me can be habit forming. Thanking God is a way of keeping everything in proper perspective. Our tendency is to blow our everyday experiences in life, to blow them all out of proportion. So consequently, we tend to treat the highs with too much emphasis and the lows we give far too much importance to. If there was something I would change about the 40 years that I had the opportunity to coach sports, it would be to take the losses with a little more thankfulness. Didn't do that very often. You know, not thanking God for losing, no, but thanking God and recognizing the goodness of God in the midst of losing. See, that's, that perspective is really representing who we are in Christ. I hated losing. Always did. Truth is, I still don't like losing. But it's possible to hate losing, yet at the same time possess a thankful heart as one who has just lost. We should all have Psalm 100 memorized. Psalm 100, known as the Psalm of Grateful Praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. You know, repeating that daily from our hearts will give every one of us a whole new perspective of both winning and losing. Now let's, let's take a look at this next part of today's text. But thanks be to God who puts us on display in Christ. Now, many of you have a different version of the Bible. And it reads, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. And both those meanings are the same. See, the imagery is of a conquering Roman general who's parading around the city his victorious soldiers as the people uh, watched and applauded. See, that us that he's talking about, Paul is referring to is us. You and me. God puts us, you and me, his church, his Holy Spirit filled people, he puts us on display. Why? Why would God put us on display? The same reason we display things. Why do we display things? Well, maybe they have special meaning to us, right? We're proud of them, we want to show them off. Maybe we display things because they're attractive. And we know that others would appreciate their attractiveness. Sometimes we display things because they're valuable. One-of-a-kind items, real rare. So we'll display them out for others to appreciate. You know, as an educator, I displayed things as a way of teaching others, as communicating to others certain things. Well, I believe it's the same with God. He's proud of us. He finds us attractive. He believes others will find us attractive too. 
He displays us in order for us to teach or communicate things to others. See, I, I truly believe God places a tag on each one of us that reads, highly valued by their father. The question we have to ask ourselves today is, are we living a display-worthy life? See, inanimate objects, once they're on display, that's it. Okay? People see them and then they personally can determine their value and attractiveness. As the living, breathing people of God, we have the option of being attractive or not. I mean, we could be eye-catching or we can be repulsive. See, when we're on display and we're found attractive, what we have to keep in mind is, as the, as the children of God, exactly where our attraction comes from. Our attraction isn't really us. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. See, our light, our light that we shine, that's the light of the world. And listen, when you're on display as a child of God, the reality is, not everybody's going to find you attractive. As a matter of fact, when we are on display in Christ, some will find us repulsive. Last week we learned when people are repulsed by us as believers, the repulsion isn't us. The repulsion is Christ in us. John 15, 19, and 21. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. Thank you, Jesus. That is why the world hates you. They will treat you this way because of my name, because of me, because of who I am and who I am in you. 1 Peter 4.16, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. As a Christian, meaning displaying Christ, manifesting a Christ-like nature, holding, holding out the truth of God. And Peter says, when you hold the truth of God out, there is a chance that suffering is going to be involved. Now, whatever translation we are reading, Thanks be to God who always puts us on display or thanks be to God who leads us in triumphal procession. We could not miss the intent of the verse because that is the most important thing. We're never to put ourselves on display. See, it's God who puts us. It's God who leads us. That's the only way this thing's going to work. See, we're, we're told that his aroma is spread through us. It's us who emits the fragrance of Christ. When we display ourselves, then it's us that people see. It's us that people hear. Consequently, it is our aroma, our fragrance that they're drawing in. And, and don't take this personal, but not a one of you smell anywhere near as good as Jesus. Now let's take a look at Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who's able to immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now this is monumental and it has a two-fold meaning. This is meant for us individually. And it's meant for us corporately as the local body, the local church, precisely here today, us, the church of the rock. Now, I know this is hard to believe, but as the pastor, I get great suggestions all the time. It's amazing. How many come from my very house? <laughs> pastor, I have an idea. Or... Pastor, here's something I thought we could do. 
Or, Pastor, here's what we did at our old church. Or, <laughs> or Pastor, here's what such and such church is doing. Now, many of those suggestions are great suggestions. And, and lots of times, I, I got to admit, I, I find them attractive. The idea looks appealing. But before we implement any of those as a church, there is one important process to be considered. And today's scripture makes it very clear. Who is to do the displaying? Who is to do the leading? Don't, now don't let that stop you from making suggestions. Because sometimes your suggestion confirms to me or affirms to me some of the same things I think the Lord is speaking to me. And that's a good thing. But just don't take it personal. If your suggestion is not implemented. I had the privilege of being a head coach for many years. And I had the privilege of being an assistant coach. And both were fun. I enjoyed them both, but they were way different. You see, as an assistant coach, I always wanted to go to the head coach. And I wanted to do things that were on the cutting edge. Out there on a limb where we'd have to be taking chances. I suggest that all the time. Hey, let's do this. I think we ought to do that. This would be awesome, right? As a head coach, when my assistant coaches would do the same thing, I'd tell them, yeah. You know, that's easy for you to take all those chances. Because when this whole thing goes south, guess what? Hey, who's the head coach around here, right? <laughs> now, in the church, I don't get too concerned with the whole thing going south. <laughs> really. But I do consider whether or not God is leading us to do it. Is God the one that's putting us on display? There are some suggestions, even some that I've had myself, that it's apparent we'd be putting ourselves on display rather than God putting us on display. And see, that will never result in others drawing in God's aroma. If another church is doing it, it doesn't make it automatic that we're supposed to be doing it. Just like, hey, the spread offense works at Oregon. Why don't we put the spread offense in right here? No. Just because it's working over there, it's such and such church. The question we have to answer is, are we being called as a body to be doing it? Keep in mind the whole verse. But thanks be to God who always puts us on display in Christ. He leads us. He displays us in Christ. When we allow ourselves to be displayed, when we're living surrendered lives and being led by the Lord, we are the aroma of Christ. And according to God's word, that aroma can be the fragrance of life. It can also be the smell of death. You see, when the gospel is preached, or it's taught, or it's even manifested through the lives of God's people, it is incredibly good news to some people. But it's reprehensible. It is repulsive news to other people. For the believer, every time the word of God is read or heard, it encourages, it reinforces, it comforts, it relieves, it causes feelings of joy. The fragrance of life eternal. But for those who are spiritually lost, it doesn't do any of those things. As a matter of fact, often it has the opposite effect. Why? Because it is a reminder of every good thing that the spiritually lost person does not possess. That's the trademark of God's word. Whether it's read, it's preached, or even lived out, there will always be a reaction to the Word of God. Can't help but be a reaction. To the believer, it's filled with life-giving fragrance. To the unbeliever, it smells foul, like death, their own. See, all we have to do is read the, the Gospels and see that wherever Jesus went, Whenever he, he did anything or spoke to the people, whatever, there was a reaction. People were either blessed and captivated by the word of the Lord, or they were deeply offended by the word of the Lord. Regardless, something took place. Isaiah 55, 11, 
so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. Without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. The word of God, spoken, read, preached, lived. To be joyfully received, or to be incredibly offensive. Do you believe that God intended his word to be offensive? Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Do you think that there are people who take offense to being judged? <laughs> Rhetorical question, of course they do. See, that's why one of the most often retorts used by the world when we speak Scripture is, don't you dare judge me. But the best part of quoting Scripture, whether we're on display or we're being led, see, it's not us doing the judging. No, it's God's Word. And one of the purposes of the Word of God that we read in Hebrews is to judge. Read, what do you think about same-sex marriage? You know what? It doesn't matter one bit what I think. But if you want to know, let's take a, word, a look at what, what God's Word has to say. See, our, our, our opinion doesn't matter, brothers and sisters. Don't judge people by your own words. Judge them right here. If they want to know, if they're asking, if they don't want to know, don't worry about it. Live your life. Let them live theirs. But if they ask, you got to tell them. Great, great verse in Isaiah. My word will not return to me empty without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. You know, God has a purpose every time his word is spoken. Every time his word is read, every time we live his word, he has a purpose in that. Now, why is the word of God offensive? Well, let's go back to last week's scripture. Luke 16, 13. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. We are all serving spiritually. We are all serving one of two masters. There's no third master. If you're serving yourself, you're not serving the Lord. Okay? Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. There are only two spirit forces active in the universe. The spirit of God and the spirit against God. Those two. That is called the spirit of the world, the spirit of the devil. And every person on the planet has as his or her master either or. Now out of the, the six weapons of war that God gave us to fight this crusade, to fight this battle, five of those weapons are defensive weapons. Right? The belt, the breastplate, footwear, shield, the helmet. And there's one offensive weapon. Any guesses as to which weapon is offensive? Ephesians 6, 17. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God designed His Word to be offensive. We don't make it offensive. But when we're on display, when we're being led, the Word we speak can be a very offensive word. Hebrews 4.12, again, sharper than any double-edged sword. The word of God penetrates to even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Yes, that's right. It's the word of God that penetrates. It's like two teams after the big win. Hey, all you guys on the team that won, listen. Your winning bonus, 50 grand. Every one of you and all the members of your family, you get to go to Tahiti. And every one of you on the winning team, go pick out any car you want. 
Hey, all you who just lost the game, listen up. You get to watch the winners celebrate. Wow. The words and the aroma of victory, right? Or the words and the stench of defeat. But the incredible generous offer in this game of life, regardless of where you've been playing it from, regardless of which side you've been living on, you can choose at any time to be a member of the winning team. See, the Word of God is a life dispenser. It dispenses life. What is the Word of God? It's not what, really, but who. Christ is the Word. A theological mystery. He's a man. He's the Savior. He's the Son of God. He is God, but He's also the Word. John 1, 1 and 1 to 4, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. Christ is the living Word. And He is life. Life eternal. 1 Peter 1 23, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. The Word of God presents and spells out the gospel, the good news of Christ, who came to save the world. As we allow God to lead us, to display us, the gospel is presented to those who are lost in their sins and calls the sinner to repent and believe in Christ, receive Christ's salvation. To every one of them, that knowledge, that experience is marked by an incredible aroma, a sweet fragrance. You recall it, right? To those who are perishing, that same gospel, the good news, is presented, but instead of receiving it, they're rejecting it. And listen, when the gospel is rejected, it leads not to life, but to death. And that experience, either or, acceptance or rejection, it's marked by a horrible aroma, a sickening fragrance, or the smell of life. See, it's God's desire. See, he wants, to, he wants to display us. Just like we display things. Oh, yeah. He wants us displayed. He wants us filling this world with the aroma of Christ. Mm. These are the kids that are displaying it right here, the little ones. He wants us. He wants us everywhere to display Him. He wants us around this world giving people the understanding the knowledge of Him. Are we living? Are we living a display worthy life? Is that us? Come on. Is that, is that who we are? Is that what we're projecting to this world? Oh. Sweet smell of Christ, of life. Everywhere. Could be, it could be in Poland, it could be in Struthers, it, it, it could be in New Middletown, it could be in Columbus, it could be, Cl it, it could be anywhere. Are we displaying Christ wherever we go? I don't want to forget this one. Alright? Leave the 99 and go find the one. There's a whole other sermon in that. <laughs> Is that what we're doing? Because that's what we need to be doing. 
Listen, when we, when we send out the, the aroma of Christ, because we're on display by God, not on display by ourselves, when we send this aroma out, it, it, it's going to do one of two things. But listen, it's not up to us which one of those it is. It's not, they're, they're not going to find a sweet smelling because we try harder or, or we really show them what, no. Listen, when we're on display, when we're being led, when the aroma is going out from, from, from who we are, from just living for Christ, one of two things are going to happen, and one is awful good. But the other one might be just, say, you're just sowing a seed. You're sowing a seed. And we, you know, we're not going to see. One of the most amazing things I think is going to happen one day when we're in heaven. Come on. You know, when we're there 10,000 years and we've just begun. Someone will walk up to you. And they're going to say, listen, you don't know me. But you knew my great grandmother. And you know what? You kept telling her about Jesus. And there came a point in her life where she received Christ as her Lord and Savior. And she brought my, my grandmother up that way. To understand the gospel. And my grandmother brought my mother up that way. And my mom, because of you, brought me up that way. And I'm here today to tell you four generations later, I'm here because of what you did. I'm here because of how you smelled. I'm here because of how you allowed yourself to be on display. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession, always puts us on display in Christ. And through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. In every place. For to God we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some we are the aroma of death leading to death. But to others an aroma of life leading to life. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, what a... What a blessing and, and what really truly a, a, an opportunity that you have given each one of us, Lord. To allow ourselves to be on display. To allow ourselves to be led in triumphal procession. Individually, Lord, and as a corporate body, as a local body. We ask you, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Lord, I, I don't want to put myself on display. That, that never ends well. But I want to be put on display. Show me. Teach me. And, and, and Father, my prayer as, as a pastor, that I, I want this body, this church, to be on display. Not, not because people will, will get so excited about Church of the Rock, but they'll get excited about Jesus. Show us, Lord, how to be that that display, so that others won't look to us as a, as a body, but they'll look to you as the Savior. For that is our desire, Lord. And how can, we, how can we better do that? I do thank you for things that people suggest to me, Lord. I, I thank you for them. For so often they're very affirming. My prayer is that you unify us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. That we think about what it is that you desire for us and we learn that through your word. Continue to bless us as you have, Lord God. It's been an amazing road so far and one even better to continue on with. I thank you for allowing me to serve with a body such as this. We do praise you. We do thank you now. We do it now, Lord, and we also will do it evermore. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.